Come on, put your hands together.
again and allowed us to see another Sunday morning. Certainly want to say uh, to all of you, we are just grateful for what the Lord is doing within our country, within our community, as well within our church. And so on this Sunday morning, we want to lift our hands and give him praise, honor, and glory because it all belongs to him. Amen. This morning, I want to call your attention to Psalms 22, Psalms 22. And I want to read this uh, from the Amplified Version, beginning at verse number one. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I call out by day, but you do not answer. And 
by night, but I find no rest nor quiet. But you are holy, O you who are enthroned in the holy place where the praises of Israel are offered. In you our fathers trusted, leaned on, relied on, and were confident. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not disappointed or ashamed. I want to talk this morning from this subject, when God is silent, when God is silent. Have you ever felt like God has forgotten about you? Think about that question for a moment. Have you ever felt like God has forgotten about you? When I think about the trial of Derek, Derek Chauvin, I must admit my expectation were that some way, somehow, this guy is going to get away with cold-blooded murder. My faith as an African-American male in the legal system of our land is not very strong. Too many instances in the past where the punishment, if any at all, did not fit the crime. My heart was relieved, my mind for a brief moment experienced a sense of hope. But I must say that the battle rages on. We have many miles yet to go in this land for the fight for equality and justice for all. Like many of you, I have often wondered, I can't be the only one that sees the wrong in this situation. God, don't you see what's going on in our world? You created man to have fellowship and community with each other, but yet we see more and more hate, we see more and more senseless violence, and we see more and more murder in our streets. The good news this morning is that even in silence, God has not abandoned us. That's, that's something that we can shout about today, that we can lift our hands in celebration, that even in silence, God has not abandoned us. But perhaps you felt forgotten by God at some time or some point in your life. You prayed. But God didn't answer, at least he didn't answer the way that you anticipated. You read the Bible, but it didn't speak directly to your issue or your particular situation. Trials of life can cause us to think that God has gone on vacation and forgotten about us as well as our problems. Many of us have experienced the silence of God. We cry out to God, and there seems to be no answer. We pray, pouring out our hearts, only to hear the words echo back without a reply. The frustrating thing about that this morning is that we have conditioned ourselves to expect a direct relation between input and output. What do you mean? I, I mean by that is that if we work a certain number of hours, we will we have automatically believed that we will reach a certain level of success. If we place our children in the right schools, enroll them in the right programs, and practice the right procedures, they will turn out as we hoped they would. We invest our money strategically and wisely, we will receive a good return on our investment. When we cry out to God and nothing happens, how can we help but feel that something is not quite right and that perhaps probably the problem lies with the listener and not the communicator? Few things, few things, beloved more harmful to a relationship than a sense of not being heard or responded to. It's as if we don't matter that there is no genuine concern. If 
God is calling for our soul and we are attempting to connect with him at that level, there seems no place, no excuse for silence. Yeah. We don't understand that kind of God because we think that the God we worship should always speak, that God should always act and should always give. In fact, I would venture to say that we don't like silence. Think about it for a moment. Most of us, as soon as we get into our automobile, the radio comes on, or we connect our phones to play our favorite playlist of music while we drive. Whether or not we are listening to the words, we like the sound. As soon as we get home, we turn on the television in one room. We go into another room. We turn on the television in that room. We like sound. Hmm. We don't want to come home and check the phone and have no calls. No calls? I've been gone for 12 hours and no one has called to check on me? Huh? Must be that no one loves me anymore. No one thought enough to call on call about me in 12 hours huh. we turn on our computer you got mail we feel good we need sound we want sound we love sound but there are times in our walk with God that God goes silent hmm. in my own life I discovered God's silence can sometimes tempt me to doubt. Stay with me. But sometimes, beloved, God's silence can lead us to a richer, more varied experience with him in a surprising way. Well, what is God trying to do in me in the midst of his silence? Perhaps God is trying to create a hunger in me for him. Think about this. 1 John 5 and 14 says, This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Take a moment and think about your own physical appetite. When we are not really hungry, it's easy to be choosy in our selection of what we want to eat. Sometimes we come to God and we are already full. We are full of our own ideas. We are full of our own individual plans. We pray to him not for his presence, but for things we need answers for and the specific answers that we are desiring. The focus of our prayers are not on God. Let your will be done. No, God, I need you to do this by this time and to do it in this way. Hmm. Just as physical hunger makes us less picky about what we are eating, spiritual hunger can help us to become less picky concerning what God is saying at any particular season in our lives. Physical hunger makes me humble and grateful for whatever sustenance that is available on the table. If I allow it, spiritual hunger can make me live less on the emotional high of spiritual experiences and instead of being grateful for every opportunity to hear God's voice, even when I don't feel like it. Hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. When God is silent, our life, perhaps he's developing a hunger in each of us for the real him. 
Here it is. Creation speaks about God. Psalms 19 and 1. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Creation is always speaking on behalf of God. Every part of an artist's painting is filled with the essence of that painter. Every part of our natural world is filled with the essence of God. Think about it. Whenever we take notice of a beautiful sunset, that's the essence of God. When we look at the branches on a tree, that's the essence of God. When we listen at the singing of the birds in the air, that's the essence of God. When we feel the golden sunlit rays of the sun beaming down on our skin, that's the essence of God. When we feel the rain falling from the sky, that's the essence of God. This morning, it is my hope and prayer that you have not forgotten who God is. That you haven't forgot who God is. Just in case the tranquilizing pain of your experiences have created a temporary shortage in the frontal lobe area of your brain. That's the place in the brain where the motor function and the problem solving, the spontaneity, the memory, and the language, the initiation, the judgment, the impulses, control, and social and sexual behavior occur. Allow me just a moment to refresh and reboot your computer. Hmm. We examine the doctrine of the Trinity. We find that God is relational. Huh. What do we see when we look at the Trinity? We see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But then God is not only relational, God is eternal. Greek philosophy says eternality refers to the timelessness of God as one who exists totally beyond the temporal realm and who therefore remains untouched by events in time. Well, let me just tell you what all that really means. Since God is untouched by the events of time, he doesn't fall into a frantic frenzy when things spiral out of control in our lives. Somebody gonna catch up with me in a moment. Think about that. Look at look at how we behave sometimes when things don't flow in an orderly fashion. We fall to pieces, but God is not moved by the events of our world. He is yet calm and cool and in control. God doesn't lose sleep. Because the psalmist says that he never sleeps nor slumbers. God is eternal. Not only is God eternal, God is sufficient. Think about that word now. Not only is he eternal, that means he's everlasting, he's from everlasting to everlasting, but then God is sufficient. Yeah, yeah. Humanity is. We're, we're always in need of something, but but God has never been in need of anything. He, he is sufficient. He's he's an all sufficient God. That's why he's capable of meeting all of our needs at the same time. Think about this. When you look at Psalms 46, it'll reveal to you that God is sufficient. Take a careful stroll at your leisure through Psalm 46 and allow the Holy Spirit to open your eyes that you may see clearly in that Psalm that God is sufficient. Think about it. 
Psalms 46 was written out of the crucible of an extreme adversity from which God has provided deliverance. Uh, that's the opening of the psalm. Sets the stage of how we come to the conclusion that God is sufficient. Here it is. God is our refuge. That's enough right there. But then it goes on to say, he's a very present help in the time of trouble. God is sufficient. Mm. Look at this. This psalm relates to anyone who is in a time of trouble or, or to anyone who faces trouble, no matter how extreme or how looming it might be in the future. It tells us that when trouble strikes, God is sufficient enough to see us through. Yeah, no problem. Whether emotional, spiritual, or physical is beyond the capable hands of an almighty and sufficient God. We learn, we will learn to take refuge in him. And lean on him alone for our strength. Then with the psalmist, we can face the most extreme crisis with quiet confidence because God is with us. And not only is God with us, but God is sufficient. Creation speaks about God. But, but then secondly, we have to recognize that silence can also be a time of intimacy. Look at it. Silence can be a sign of trust. Gospel of John reveals a story about Jesus' friend Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. In fact, Minister Caldwell dealt with this, this lesson, this 11th chapter of John in the Bible study this past week. Look at this. When Jesus found out that Lazarus was ill, he did not rush to Lazarus' house to heal him. Now, now think about this. Lazarus is Jesus' friend. But he does not rush to his house upon hearing the news. <laughs> Stay with me. In fact, when you read chapter 11, verse 6, it will tell you that Jesus stayed where he was two more days. That doesn't sound very friendly to me. But, but, but you got to look at the, the, the total, totality of the situation. Jesus arrives in Bethany, but Lazarus is now dead. <laughs> So Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, Jesus' silence could have been interpreted as neglect. In other words, Jesus heard the news about his friend Lazarus, but he didn't move immediately. Think about that for a moment. He's acquainted with all of our ways. He, he knows how uh, our down sitting as well as our uprising, that there's not a thought in our minds that God is not familiar with, and there's not a situation in our lives that God is not aware of. So then, why, with all of that information, doesn't God move in a speedily fashion? Can I tell you, can I tell you why? The same reason that he said to the disciples when he said to them, listen, my friend Lazarus is sleeping. They said, well, if he is sleeping, he do it well. Jesus said, wait a minute, let me clear the air. Lazarus is not sleep. He's dead. And listen, I'm going to do something on behalf of Lazarus, but it's also to show you just who I really am. In other words, not even death 
can conquer God. Talk to me to somebody here. Not, not even that because when he reaches the tomb of Lazarus, they, they say, wait a minute, Jesus. I know that's your homeboy, that's your friend. But listen, Lazarus had been dead for four days. Can I drop this in on you? He, he, here's what here's what the rumors was around that time. The social thinking of that day was that when somebody died, that their spirit, their soul hung around the body for at least three days. Jesus said, wait a minute, I want to dispel that rumor so I'm going to allow Lazarus to die just so I can raise him up again. That, that's the kind of God that we serve. God will allow some things to die in your life just so that he can raise it up again. Oswell Chambers, in his, in his writing, my utmost for his highest, says, when you cannot hear God, when you cannot hear God, you will find that he has trusted you in the most intimate way possible. But absolute silence, not a silence of despair, but one of pleasure. Because he saw that you could withstand an even bigger revelation. Sometimes God goes silent because he sees and knows that you still have it under control. Uh, talk to me somebody. I, I know internally we are falling to pieces, but, but God understands enough about us that he knows just how much we can bear. Look at this. When you are completely comfortable with a person, it is possible to sit in a room together and not utter a word. In love, silence can be a sign of intimacy. And when God seems silent, it can be the result of the depth of our relationship with him. Trust God has chosen each of us. He knows what we're able to bear. And even in times of despair, God is right there by our side. So creation speaks about God. Silence can be a sign of intimacy. But then lastly, when God is silent, don't stop calling on his name. Tell somebody, even when he's silent, don't stop calling on his name. In other words, don't stop praying just because he's silent. Look at this. When God is silent, doesn't mean that you doubt him or stop praying. God's silence isn't a license for us to turn our backs on him. Mm, no, don't do that. Instead, view it as an invitation to draw even closer to him. Look at this. Look at this. Matthew 15, verses 21 through 28, records the story of a Canaanite woman that comes to Jesus. And here's what she says. Lord, son of David. Look at, look at how she addresses him. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. But watch this now. Watch this. If you never read that story, it's a very short story. It won't take you very long to read it. But it's power packed with a lot of good nuggets, if you will. Look at this. She makes her petition, but Jesus doesn't say a thing. <laughs> ah, my, my, my. She lays out her complaint, but Jesus doesn't say anything. She addresses him in, in a high priestly fashion. She says, Lord, 
son of David have mercy on me. But he doesn't say a word. Perhaps, Mount Nebo and friends, perhaps for many of us, this becomes our breaking point. We, 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 are, we are at the proverbial fork in the road. If God doesn't speak, if God doesn't act, if God doesn't heal, if God doesn't deliver, if God doesn't grant my request, I'm through with him. Mm. I, I, I have my tower already raised in my hand. I'm already in the motion to throw it in. Huh. Vocal cords are loaded and ready to air the words no mas. But before you do that, let's examine the actions of a Canaanite woman as she chases after Jesus. And I'm almost done. This Canaanite woman, first of all, she has a determined spirit. That's what you got to have when, when God is silent. You, you got to maintain a determined spirit. She's uncontrollable in her determination. She has enough nerves that she won't take no for an answer. <laughs> so the Bible says she falls prostrate before Jesus. She, she worships him and says, Lord, help me. Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting part of the text for me. Because before anything is done, she worships. Y'all going to catch it in a minute. Before anything has transpired, she worships. Before her daughter is healed, she worships. Before she receives the answers to her prayer, she worships. Yeah. That's a good reminder for someone this morning that nothing should come between or before your worship of God. This is a painful moment, but allow that painful moment to make way for a powerful praise. Let what the enemy meant for evil become the driving force behind your unrelenting celebration. Yeah, praise him when things are good. Praise him when things are not so good. Praise him as a song of old would command us. Praise him in the morning and praise him in the evening. Praise him when the sun is going down. This woman to a certain extent is like Jehoshaphat when he was faced with an impossible situation. You remember he, he was facing a vast army in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. But notice what Jehoshaphat does, similar to what this Canaanite woman does. He places the choir in the front and the army behind. <laughs> that, seems, that seems backwards in our Americanized, in our Western hemisphere thinking. That, that doesn't make logical sense to us. You're going into battle. Why would you send singers and not men of war out front? Yet yeah, yeah, normally we put the army out first and then the singers come behind. Mm, 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 mm. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know you, you, you're looking at me strange. You say, Pastor must be off his rocker this morning, but it's in the text. They worship before they engage in warfare. Yeah. They worship before they engage in warfare. Somebody going to catch up with me. Here's the mistake that we so often make. We engage in warfare before we worship. And then in the heat of the battle, we become frustrated because we are now no longer operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
we run out of gas. We run out of energy. We run out of answers. We run out of power. We run out of fight. And so now we are wondering where is God? Don't miss that this morning. It's the very reason so many of us are overwhelmed. It's the reason why so many of us are perplexed on the edge all of the time because we are busy preparing for physical warfare and we have not engaged in any worship. Hmm. My, 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 my. Here it is. Worship says I'm weak, but he is strong. Yeah. Worship says, I'm totally and completely nothing without God. Worship says, I need God. I want God. I desire God. Nothing in my life is going to go right unless God is the one who's in control at the center of my life. Woman worships first. So that's a fact. And the people of God worship first. The Bible says when they begin to worship God, praising Him and playing on the symbols, God began to work. Don't miss that. I believe this morning that if you will let that praise, if you allow praise to lead the way, God will begin to move on your behalf. You let praise lead the way, God will begin to show you great and mighty things. What are you saying, Pastor McKenzie? Worship God before anything happens. Shout before your healing comes. Yeah. Shout before deliverance arrives at your doorstep. Shout before the door is open. Don't wait until the victory arrives to give God the glory. No, go ahead and praise him right now. Woman worship God. And says, Lord, have mercy. Because she understands that worship is primarily a now before it is a verb. In other words, she, she's getting herself ready to receive the answer that she's asking and seeking from God. You know this. This is basic English. A now is a person, place, or a thing. God is saying, get your nowness right, that is worship. And then your verbness will be accepted. Y'all missed the point. You, you honor me with your lips, uh, but your heart is far from me. Oh, you missed your chance to shout this morning, baby. Because you thought it was just about the words that you were saying. You, you thought that God was impressed with how you can say it, how you can articulate your, your sentence. And you thought it was about how eloquent you can speak. God ain't interested in none of that. No, it's not your lips that he wants. It's your heart that he's after. When your heart is right, your lips will echo what's in your heart. The actions of this woman. She says, Lord, help me. Don't miss that. Lord, help me. You say that's not a prayer. At least that's not much of a prayer. It's only three words. Lord, help me. If I were to stand up and pray, and all I said was, Lord, help us. You, you would think, you, you would think something is wrong. You, you would say to your neighbor, something's wrong with pastor today. He, he, he just said, Lord, help us. That, that ain't a prayer. We tend to think that we are heard for how well and how long we can pray. Hmm. Those things don't move, God. In fact, when you review the life and ministry of Jesus, as recorded in the Gospels, you will discover that Jesus does not pray long prayers. 
I know that's a shock for somebody this morning, but, but it, it ain't about your long-winded prayer. Look at this. The longest prayer on record that Jesus prayed is recorded in John 17. It's 26 verses. You can read it in a moment's notice. But look at it. It's divided into three areas. First of all, Jesus prays for himself. That is, he prays that he might be glorified, may be glorified. But then secondly, he prays for the 11 disciples. That they may be protected and sanctified. And then finally, he prays for the whole church. That is, he prays for the universal church. That they all may be unified woman says, Lord, have mercy. Short three-worded prayer. Some of us would faint. We would say, where is the rest of the prayer? But when you pray a long prayer, it means that you are not in an emergency situation. That means you got too much time on your hands to pray that long of a prayer. When you're in an emergency situation, you don't take time to tell God, God, that you will thank you, that you are omnipotent. God, I thank you that you are omnipresent. God, I thank you that you are omniscient. God, I thank you that, that you are from everlasting to everlasting. No, we don't take time to go through all of that. No, 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 no. You don't tell God he's infinite. You don't tell him that, that, that he's a God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. No, uh -uh. you don't have time for that because the matter at hand is one of great urgency. When Peter was sinking, he didn't pray a long prayer. He simply says, Lord, help me. That's it. When the thief dying on the cross was getting ready to depart his life, he simply said, Lord, remember me. That's it. Short, three-worded prayer. You don't need to have the right words because prayer is not about the multiplicity of words. It's the emotion of heavenly fire that kindles deep down on the inside of our hearts. All you need to do is have a little talk. Not a long talk with Jesus. Go on and talk to him. Tell him what's on your heart this morning. Tell him what's on your mind. God may be silent for a while, but I want to tell you that he'll speak after a while. Uh, how do you know that, Mackenzie? I'm glad you asked because I'm reminded that the greatest silence that we've ever known took place on Calvary. Yeah, on Friday, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God said nothing. In fact, the son began to protest and began to have a full eclipse because the moon came between the sun and the earth. But God said nothing. The moon began to drip away like it was hemorrhaging, but God said nothing. Yeah. The earth was like an enumerated man and began to reel and rock, but God said nothing. And even the Roman centurion soldier began to speak and say, surely this must be the son of God. But God said nothing. Nothing on Friday. Nothing on Saturday morning. Nothing on Saturday night. Yeah. But how many of you know that early on Sunday morning, silence gave away to a thunderous roar that said, all power, yeah, I got to get out of here now. All power in heaven and earth is in my hands. I want to tell you this morning that even when God seems silent in your life, there will come a time that God will speak on your behalf. Yeah, the devil is saying, it's too late. Go ahead and throw in the towel. God is not going to deliver you from this situation, from this sickness. It's too late in the evening of your life. I want to tell you and the devil, it ain't over until God says it's over. 
You ought to call somebody this morning that you know is going through a rough patch in their life and tell them that God told me to tell you it ain't over until he says it. I don't know. I know. I know it doesn't look favorable right now. God is still speaking behind the scenes. Don't give up now. You've come too far to quit. Don't you dare throw in the towel, but rather lift those hands and begin to give God the praise. Praise him for what he's getting ready to do. Praise him for what he's already done. I'm reminded this morning that the Bible says in Psalms 150 that everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. That's what we got to continue to do. Even when God is silent, don't stop petitioning him because creation speaks about God. Silence can be a sign of intimacy. But then even when he is silent, keep on calling on his name. After a while, by and by, God will speak and he'll bring about a transformation in your life that you never thought was possible. Stay on the wall. As our anniversary theme was. Stay on the wall. And refuse to come down. Even when God is silent. God bless you. May he forever keep you his our prayer. This morning you may be without a church home. May be looking for a place. That you can connect with God. And receive sound biblical teaching. We want to invite you to connect with us here at the Mount Nebo Missionary Baptist Church. Here, uh, there will be some information that will show up on the screen that you can contact us and someone will reach out to you very shortly. Also, this ministry has been a blessing to you. This word, something that the choir sang this morning, or something that has been spoken in the message, has touched your heart in a way that you feel the desire to sow a seed into this ministry. We invite you to do that as well. That, that information will also appear on the screen there that you can give your donation, your contribution. God bless you. God keep you. Certainly is our prayer. Until we meet again, when God is silent, keep seeking him, keep calling on his name, because he will answer after a while.